So my brother presented me with the um, possibilities. And then when I met John Candy at Second City, there was the same sort of burst of excitement and revelation in the possibilities. And I guess why you ask why I write music and, and do other things is because um, creativity just doesn't end at the river's edge. It goes out elsewhere. And welcome to uh, yet another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It is Luciano here speaking uh, as your host. And as per usual, I want to remind the listener, please uh, subscribe uh, and also rate us on um, whatever podcast platform you use. <clears throat> uh, we are on every major podcast platform. Uh, and if you're inclined to donate to the cause, we, we are a not-for-profit and also a charity and because we're a charity, we issue tax receipts to any donors. You can go to our site and find um, uh, and find the magic there. And go to behindgreatness.org, and uh, it will be self-explanatory. We're excited today because uh, it's taken I don't know a couple of years, John, to get you on the show. At least the, the listener will see how 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 timid a character you are, and they'll, they'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, been we finally have you. We finally have you. We finally have you, John. So um, uh, you can continue doing your taxes while I read your bio. <laughs> I will. I will because this is the intro was so riveting. I just want you to keep on going. I can finish my taxes, Canadian yes. and American. I am going to be in a constant state of disappointing you this uh, this whole episode. Uh, all right, John. Uh, John is best known. John Capellos is best known for his iconic role as Carl the Janitor in John Hughes' The Breakfast Club, 1985. Uh, he also co-starred in several of John Hughes' generation-defining Brat Pack films, including 16 Candles and Weird Science. Uh, Hughes had discovered him when Capellos was a member of the resident company at Chicago's legendary Second City. He spent eight years at Second City, both in their Chicago main stage and international touring company, and in Orwell, that ends well. Uh, their triumphant uh, 84 off-Broadway return at the celebrated Village Gate in Manhattan. Since then, John has made his mark in more than 60 feature films, including Roxanne, Legally Blonde, uh, the independent feature uh, Afternoon Delight, written and directed by Jill Soloway, uh, that won uh, the Sundance Film Festival 2015 Directing Award for the film. Uh, he was also in an independent feature 22 Chaser, and in acclaimed director Guillermo del Toro's up, up, it wasn't upcoming, it's already done, it's already done, excuse me, at The Shape of Water. He also produced and starred in the popular short film Commentary, uh, which you never mentioned to me before. So I'm <coughs> very curious. Pardon me. No, I didn't. <coughs> you did. It makes me choke to think about it. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a, an adventure. But yeah, um, Guillermo del Toro's Shape of Water and then... Um, more recently, I've been in the Umbrella Academy and um, uh, a few other films. Um, did a movie called Love Shot, which I don't know whether it's part of your thing no, there. No, it's not here. Love Shot. It's all good. It's doing really well. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, it, it, you've done a whole bunch of other TV work, uh, including guest starring and recurring roles in Conviction, Graceland, Republic of Doyle, Psych. Um, uh, NCIS, Modern Family, Seinfeld. Seinfeld, I didn't know. Seinfeld, I didn't know. I want to see that. Uh, Frasier, Shameless, Castle, Law and Order, uh, Los Angeles, uh, House, CSI, New York, West Wing, and the sci fi called Favorite, US Canadian co production Forever Night, K N I G H T. Also, I did The Expanse, the Expanse which I think was shot in Canada, which is another sci fi Canadian American thing. Fantastic. And then, uh, well, last, I want to talk about your music, or we can read a little bit about what uh, you've done on the music side. You did a couple of uh, ambitious projects. Uh, you recorded two Christmas singles, Your Mean One, Mr. Grinch, which I listened to, and Santa Claus is Coming to Town. And you released, before COVID, um, an album that you can find, a listener can find on Spotify, uh, entitled Too Hip for the Room, set of jazz compositions, which are both, I like this, satiric and delicious. And I agree with that. Uh, and specifically with the song, My Goodness. That was my favorite one. Yeah, that's the tasty one. 
You uh, so this is also something I didn't know. You wrote seven of the CDs, twelve songs, which include his cover and a music video of the Breakfast Club theme, "Simple Minds," nineteen eighties mega hit. Don't you forget about me? Yeah, I didn't write that, but I covered it. That's for sure. I uh, wish I had written it. I'd be a billionaire. That uh, what's his name? Forcey. Those guys have made a lot of money off that song. But anyway, what, a, what a song! Like that that defined my childhood in the eighties. It's a cool song. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I have to say, the guy, uh, Jim Kerr in Simple Minds, the one and only time I met him and had a talk with him, I said, boy, it's a great tune. He goes, we didn't want to record it, man. We still wish we didn't. Did it's it? like, okay. It's, it's what... Um, Is he offering up his royalties to somebody else then? I don't know. It's what put him on the map. Sure. Um, but, but, you know, that song was offered to uh, David Bowie, Brian Ferry, and Billy Idol, and they all turned it down. And Simple Minds finally recorded. But, you know, uh, Brian Ferry could have done a nice job on it. And uh, I think Billy Idol probably could have done a nice job on it. But I think that they did, you know, it ended up with them. And um, Wouldn't have like been that. defining. Wouldn't have been defining as that one is. And, right. and, and Which defined one of the movies that defined that decade, which you were in as well. John. Yeah. Um, why did you leave journalism to go into theater you called it an audacious decision uh, well i went into journalism the year after watergate happened like 1974 was when i graduated from high school and watergate happened what 72 73 mm -hmm. and there was a there were a glut of students at carlton first year journalism so it was a huge class and there were great teachers there um uh, mcphail uh a guy named Ted McPhail and and uh, um, a guy named Robert uh, McFadden, who was a really brilliant lecturer, came from McGill. I mean, it was really an interesting time. And uh, there are a lot of really great people that were in the class, uh, people that have gone on to become Canadian and international journalists because Canada produces a lot of journalists. But after a year of it, you know, there's a, there's a lot in the first year of journalism that's not romantic. There's learning shorthand and all sorts of other stuff. But there wasn't any me in journalism. <laughs> I discovered that I needed to be a little more, bit more in an ego-driven world. That's where the theater and kicked in. And I, I started doing plays at Carleton University. And then, um, you know... I had an altruistic. I have an altruistic side of me that would have loved to, you know, but gone off and become a journalist. But you know, a lot of these people make incredible sacrifices that I just couldn't do. I mean, my sacrifices I've made to be an actor. I mean, it's a life full of sacrifices. Well, we've talked about this on a podcast too. To devoting devoting a life to uh, the vocation of an artistry or an, uh, a form of artistry. When you're 18 or 19, or in those years, you know. Um, at least for me, uh, I, I thought I had to choose a pathway. And, you know, the, the one pathway lay ahead was journalism and another pathway ahead was the theater. And I had more passion for the theater. I still have. So that's where I went. You, you said um, that y this is more, uh, you wanted a more ego-driven play. Uh, and that's why, no pun intended, that's why you went into theater. But it, was it to that? Was it just to that? Like, no. What is but, it that pushed you as an 18, 19 year old to go into something that was, it's the polar opposite in terms of performance from, from journalism? Well, I think the one thing that um, an actor, I can only obviously speak for myself, but what I, what I seem to think when I see people that uh, share the same sort of, um, have the same sort of passion, drive, whatever, to do what, what we do, which is, you know, to act and to sort of live in weird apartments and to, um, starve and to do things and to do unusual plays and strange places and all sorts of things and then work with people that are a borderline psychotic or a genius but um, but you you sort of you know you look at what's out there when you're a kid or when you're starting out and you say well I can do that now, if you want to go to law school and you see somebody that becomes a lawyer and you, as a lawyer, you're, I can do that. Well, then you go into law school. Well, I looked at um, people on stage or films and said, well, I want to do that. And then then there was a re realization after having studied, done a few plays, I can do that. So the possibility of being able to do that 
you know, um, and and also, yeah, the fact that it was dangerous, i.e., you know, like, you know, uh, the chances of success were, were minimal, are minimal, um, continued success. Because it, what you learn after even all this time is that it's a constant thing. You know, you, you just don't achieve any sort of state in my 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 profession and then stay there. It's never constant. You know, you can see people who have had careers that, you know, we can example all sorts of different types of careers. But for me, it was just, you know, I can do that. I saw this. So that's the ego part of it. Me, I, um, and then, and then you have to develop the skill set because once you realize, Oh, I want to get up on stage and perform and be, be, you know, uh, expose myself that way. Um, there is a tremendous part of you that goes, well, I better know what I'm doing because I don't want to look like an idiot. And then there's the, the, the other side of it is like, you know, get to know what you're doing because, <laughs> because the only way you're going to make it is to, to, to know uh, your, your stuff. And, um, and, you know, I have to say my dad um, said to me, okay, if you're going to be an actor, then just be the best. You know, and and that's a wonderful sort of, you know, shoot for the top sort of mentality. But also, I think what he was saying is, okay, well, then dedicate your life to it and do it. Just don't phone it in. So it, it, I, I want to make sure that I understand. When your dad said that, was your dad that was that your dad's first reaction when you came out of the acting closet, or was that it, it ended up that your dad told you that? No, my first reaction for my father was, oh my goodness. You really think you want to do this? And I went, yeah. But he, he was supportive. He, well, he said, you know, you've got the tools to do it, you know, the, the rough tools. But here's the deal. He said, um, if if you don't make it after a certain time, and he laid out a year, that was, I'm sure, negotiable, then you're going to go back to school. And then I, I said, that's a fair proposition. Hmm. You know, take take some time off. And he said, but please, whatever you do, don't become a waiter or a bartender. We had gone to New York on my parents' anniversary a couple of years before. And we ended up going to a lot of restaurants and seeing plays and stuff. And every waiter or waitress we had was an actor. You know, they all, they all had dreams and stuff. And my parents were sort of drilling them, knowing that, you know, I liked the arts at that time. So I remember they were sort of doing that for my benefit. But he said, remember when we were in New York, you know, and all those. He said, don't become one of those. So that kind of... Um, inadvertently i think he motivated me to get into that sort of world i don't want to do this is your life thing but but you mentioned your dad um so you pro you you prompted the discussion your dad before i could and i i thought maybe the the listener might benefit from kind of the backstory as well your your dad is or was greek greek descent um, can you, for the listener, just explain what his uh, early story was and uh, what conditions he was in when he came over? Or what was what was the story coming over? Well, Dad came over, it'll be next year, I think, 1923 would be 100 years when he came over. And he was about 10, 11, 10 going on 11 years old. He was born in 1913. So, um, and he came alone from Piraeus to Marseille, from Marseille to Halifax, from Halifax to Montreal on a boat. Um, and he yeah, met, was met with by his 16-year-old brother in Montreal, and they came to London, Ontario. And this is where they set up shop in that sort of community, because my uncle had been there, and there were a lot of Greeks from our community there. But that's when my dad came. And very white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Canada, 1923. You read about it now. Uh, and it was a time when actually immigration was closing down in a lot of parts of the Canada and the U.S. because there had been a glut of Italian Greeks. and So they changed immigration laws. And there was a lot of prejudice in Canada. My father was walking down the street in Toronto with his brother and uh was talking greek in 1931 or two several years later my dad's maybe what now close to 20 19 or 20 and he's speaking greek to his brother and this woman well in her 70s comes up and backhands him across the face on blur and 
Spadina hits my dad across the face and says, speak English. No. Could you imagine somebody hitting somebody now who's speaking another language in Canada? It would, it would be assault and it would probably go to the Supreme Court. But prejudice um, reared its head. And my dad would say that Toronto particularly was a pretty uh, straight-laced city until 1960-61. I mean, and I'm sure your family can attest to that too. I mean, you know, all the Italians that came to build the Erie Canal and everybody and a lot of laborers. And uh, as a result, my dad was, was uh, went, uh, grew up in London, Ontario, put himself to public school and high school, went to university at, at Guelph. And then when the war came, he volunteered and was in the Royal Canadian Air Force for four years and came back and married my mother, who was from the United States. And that's how I got my U.S. citizenship. She hung on to her U.S. citizenship. And then we were all raised in Toronto. I mean, in London, Ontario, two hours from Toronto. And uh, uh, dad um, uh, and had a clothing store. Mm -hmm. He got into the clothing business. And I have an older brother and sister. And my brother is in Toronto and my sister's in the U.S. Yeah, you said uh, you, you said you came. You, you could count the days when your mom wasn't home to make you lunch at noon back in school. Oh, my mother was home from kindergarten through grade eight. I mean, every day for lunch. I think maybe twice. You know, once she had a dentist appointment or something, and she couldn't cancel. I mean, you know, it, you remember that day when she wasn't there for you. You she kidding me? Down. I remember the day, the hour, the minute. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, I, I thrived on a routine. I think a lot of kids sure. do. I mean, one thing I might have mentioned to you when we were talking before was the fact that I had such a really stolid, solid, you know, kindergarten through grade eight, same school, same route home, same, you know, allowed me, I think, in a lot of ways to become a, a nomad and a gypsy and to be able to have such a, a, a traveling adult life, which I have. Yeah, you said that the, in life there are leavers and stayers. Yeah, and your early teens that you want to get out. And then you said something else as well that uh, interests me because I, I like to ask this all the time of myself and then of people who tell me this thing. You said it wasn't really trying to get out, but it's more of where you wanted to go. Yeah, I mean, sometimes people want to get out. I mean, for my sake, I wanted to get out, but like, it's like, not for the sake of leaving London, but like, where am I going to go and what am I going to see and the excitement of seeing other things. Mm. And, and experiencing other things. And I think that's what the leavers, as I would say, the L-E-A-V-E-R-S, um, they're ones that seek adventure and, and, and seek different horizons. I first went to Ottawa to University. Then I went to Vancouver. Then I went to Toronto. Then I went to Chicago. Then I went to New York. Then I went to L.A. And every one of those cities is incrementally larger. Yeah. So by the time I, I mean, and that's over a course of many years, but um, I experienced a lot of different places and a lot of different cities. When I toured with Second City, I toured, my God, over 38 states. We played, including, as I like to say, confusion and disorientation, uh, being states, right? Uh-huh. But, um, you know, the, 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 the thrill of seeing different things, I think, um, has never escaped me. And, you know, I would like to travel. I mean, honestly, I haven't seen as much of the world as, you know, maybe even you. I've never been to a lot of places that I want to go to. And I would love to. I mean, so. But you, I think one of the reasons why I really have been wanting to speak with you on this podcast, because we in, in the past, our conversations are about me learning the exploration that you've gone through. And, then, you know, we 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 talk about and ask you questions. You you do you have been traveling, if I can say this, in your um, in your creative scape, because you you not only did you try acting and were you good at it and you've done so many things with it, but it seems to me that you've been very restless with your um, uh, with your creative endeavors. So you you've you've written and you write and you also play music. Why mm -hmm. are you doing these things uh, and not something um, inartistic? Well, like shoveling the sidewalk? <laughs> um, um, I, don't I mean, know, the, the, the inartistic, 
Well, I mean, like um, playing with my money, or no, um, <laughs> no, like 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 I said, like accounting, like uh, uh, something to try something else out that doesn't exercise the the right side, uh, but maybe more uh, the left side of your brain. You know, Luciano, I made a commitment when I was about. 15 or 16, a private commitment. I've never really spoken about it out loud, but to be, to make a, do a creative act every day. I just, um, I'm a creative type of person. I think, I think, um, I believe my greatest gift is having, there's a really great book that your folks should read called born to rebel. Um, it's got a lot of other aspects in it, but one of the aspects in it is about how your relationship to your siblings um, uh, sometimes shapes more who you are than your relationship to your parents. Now, hmm. I I really was fortunate and am fortunate, thank God, to have an older brother and sister who are um, pretty remarkable and that I love dearly, and also parents that made sure that we despite any differences we might have, politics, family, if who, whoever who marries or differences in whatever, somebody makes more money, that we never stop talking to one another. And one of the most tragedies I meet with other folks and people, friends and family members, cousins, whatever, is that sometimes people stop talking to their siblings for a variety of reasons. And they may be justified, but I was very lucky to have a father and a mother that made sure that we not along, and also siblings that that um, understood that. So, and they're older than I am. I was sort of the love child, or mistake, as I like to call myself. But my parents hated both those terms. Um, Did your siblings call you a mistake behind their back? No, 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 no. Nobody. That, that was just me being victimized. <laughs> that, was, that was the dramatic John. Yeah, uh, right, right. Else. That's no, what, that's what that's what pushes you on the stage. Right. Yeah. My own, my own self victimization. <laughs> the youngest has a big load to carry. Um, sure. But, but the, the fact is that uh, my brother and sister are, are brilliant academically and they drove the, I, I could never match them academically. So part of me in this, and this born to rebel book makes this point that an inordinate number of younger children, youngest children are performers, comedians, creative types it's really remarkable now it doesn't always hold true oh that's true in my family and the remarkable number of middle children are labor negotiators or accountants or or people that uh sort of politicians certain people and then a lot of, uh, eldest children tend to be world leaders and and you know heads of ceos and things like that so there's this kind of thing that follows my sister had her own company my brother's an architect um, and has brilliance with both numbers and art, you know, the, the marriage of those things. Hmm. Um, I, I was also very fortunate because my brother is so remarkably creative that when I was a little boy at Christmas, Christmas, he would make gifts uh, and all the gifts would be in boxes, but he would make the boxes into a train. So I wouldn't even want to open the boxes because the train he made with the gift <laughs> was so cool. cool. And he said, but no, but open the boxes. So he made this huge choo-choo train with all these different. So, I mean, it was creativity within creativity, you yeah, know, awesome. kind of like the Russian doll thing. Like you open this and that was there. And then this was there. And so my brother presented me with the um, possibilities. And then when I met John Candy at Second City, there was the same sort of burst of excitement and revelation in the possibilities. And I guess why you ask why I write music and, and do other things is because um, creativity just doesn't end at the river's edge. It goes out elsewhere. So for a person like myself, you know, I mean, I like to sketch. I like to draw. I'm not, I'm not particularly, you know, proficient at it. but. You do things, one does things if one's creative that that stimulates that. Um I and I and I honestly couldn't be an accountant, couldn't do it. Uh, well, I believe in you, number one, John. But uh <laughs> because if you wanted to be, I would support you. Uh <laughs> but you know, but you know, my dad had a clothing store, and you know, yeah. I loved my dad and I loved the store, but I didn't love working there. And we'd open at eight in the morning and he'd say, uh, sweep the floors. 
So I'd sweep the floors and I'd look up at the clock and it was 8.07. <laughs> and then he said, okay, uh, 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 dust some of these shirts, take some of these shirts out over here and, and clean up those that area there. So I'd clean up that area and I'd look at the clock and it was 8.23. And like the day, the day would just creep by. And then at 8.47, he'd say, why don't you go out and get us some coffee? So I went, oh, great. So I'd go out and go yeah. to the, the restaurant down the street and I'd get some coffees and donuts and I'd come back. And now it's 9.07, right? And like the rest of the day would creep by, you know? We didn't have too many customers. It was a small store and some days it would be busy, but when it wasn't. But I'd go on a film set and I'd go on at 4.35 in the morning. And I go in the makeup and then the trailer and boom, boom, boom. And I start my day. And then they tap me on the shoulder and they say, okay, John, you're wrapped. It's over. And I look at my clock and it's 10 at night. And I go, where have the last 16 hours gone? I don't even think about it. Magic. Because I'm involved in what I'm doing. So, you know what I mean? Uh, time time compresses when you're involved in a, pro- a, pros- a project that... I couldn't sit in a clothing store. I couldn't be an accountant. I couldn't do what you do, uh, you know, uh, lecture students and be a talk about business. That's not my thing. Uh, nice, John. Uh, way to put me in a small box. I appreciate it. No, 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 no. But I mean, my brother, my, <laughs> I'm kidding. I have so many wonderful teachers in my family that, they, that you know, and I'm not putting you in a box. But I'm, what I'm saying is that that's not that's not where I thrive. You know, my, you know. It's two in the morning and you need to finish a take and you, you know, got me there and that's, that's where well, I'm, you know, it's, uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for trying to apologize. Um, no, no, but I mean it, I'm not, I'm not putting you in a box whatsoever. <laughs> no, 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 no it, it, but it's good. I'm, I'm glad, um, I'm glad you're taking a shot there, even though it didn't feel like you were taking a shot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, because I think, so let's use me as an example here because I, I want to explore this with you. Um, I, I wanted to, I just, I wanted to write when I was younger. I just wanted to write. Um, but I, I, I think I mentioned this on an earlier podcast. I didn't know that that would be a possibility for me at all in my future or for my future. So I just wrote because I love writing. If I had thought that that would be a chance for me to just explore professionally speaking, just into my adulthood, maybe things would have changed. I don't know. I, I'm not talking here with regrets looking back. Yeah. But because I didn't change that, I went on, I went to business school because I thought, you know, I, I need a job, I need a career, I need to buy a house, I need to have a family, yeah, you know, all that, all that stuff, right? I, I had to have the 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 next domino fall, like it, like yeah, I needed the planet. Um, and then I started to get bored of what I was working in. Then I started to get more bored at the next place I was working at. And then I started, I, I started my own business. And then uh, as I started my own business, I, I wanted, I wanted to leave. I'm using your word, right? I wanted to leave, so I, I, I decided that the business that I wanted to be in. Uh, wanted to, I, I wanted to be outside of my sphere. I wanted to be outside of my own country. I wanted to be in several countries. I wanted to develop relationships. And then I thought, you know, why don't, why don't I also try this teaching thing? So I, I, and I, and I have been for the last several years, I teach a course a semester and, and I kind of like it. And, and then this podcast, and now I'm thinking, as you said this, I'm sorry, go on for long, but oh, as you said this, it's maybe maybe coming to me why I do what I do and why I don't want to be defined by what I do because I do a lot of things and I like doing a lot of things. Maybe I'm trying to answer the creative call that I didn't answer at the beginning. And subconsciously I'm making up for that by uh, going beyond the river's edge to use your, to use your words. Maybe that's what we're all trying to do. We are what we are, you know, Luciano. And, you know, I can go back and example my, my dad, my dad, didn't want to own a clothing store. He harbored intellectual, you know, ambitions. He got his degree, Bachelor of Science. Mm-hmm. And yet, you know, but towards the end of his life, he got to do this cable TV show because he loved religion and he loved talking about various religions with different people. And he had this multi-ecumenical show where he'd have a rabbi, a, 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 a monsignor, et cetera, wow. on the show. And, you know, when he died, all these all these various religions folks showed up at his his funeral, but more importantly, he explored his curiosity. And and what you're doing is is precisely that, I think. And um, you know, you are who you are. You know, um, writing. You know, uh, 
unfortunately, I think a lot of people, particularly, um, well, I mean, I can't make this generalization, but I mean, in my ethnic group, you know, you were never, the Greeks were never really encouraged to go into the arts. So if, mm -hmm. if a kid or an Italian kid or something like that, yeah, your parents said, like, I want to be a writer. I guess, no, you don't. You're going to go to Sir George Brown College and become a welder, you know, yeah. I mean, or, or whatever. I mean, uh, there were types of, like, my father was one who said, look, at the clothing store where, that he had is a conduit. I want you, your sister and brother, to go off, go to university, do whatever you want, become whoever you want. That was my dad's ambition. But there are some ethnic parents, let's say, I, a couple of people I know whose parents worked in the kitchen at a restaurant and their, their, their son or daughter was particularly brilliant and wanted to go to off to school. And the father would say, no, he's not going to there because if it's the, the restaurant is good enough for me, it's going to be good enough for him. Mm -hmm. So they had this sort of, you know, a different view of it. Mm -hmm. Like my son's not going to go off and do that. And too often I saw that with, with friends of mine, uh, other Greek kids whose parents would say, forget it. And like, they'd look at me and say, I can't believe your parents are letting you do that. And in a lot of ways, you know, when my father um, said, okay, go off and fly for a year, see whether you can get, you know, uh, get that, you know, acting career going, you know, there was a beauty in that. And, and, and um, I don't even know whether, um, you know, a lot of people, Parents would be allow their kids to do. I mean, a lot of parents are encourage their kids these days to become going to the arts. But I don't know. It's a sort of a bravery in that. But I'm sort of drifting off. I think that I think that you're that you're harboring writing and then doing what you're doing in your journey. I think uh, leads leads one on a path. You do what you do. I took eight years of piano when I was a kid, and people like yourself asked me, "Well, why do you do music?" Well. Music never really left me. It's mm. just, it's always been there. Um, but, but my goodness, um, I, you know, I don't know who said this quote, but I mean, I could use four lifetimes. You know, I'm, you know, right now it's like, boy, I, I could start again and do another 45, 50 years of just studying the piano. If or, you, or If you were to believe in reincarnation, would it, do you think that this would be your last lifetime? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether I believe in that. I, I'm thinking perhaps I've been around the block a few times because I'm such an imperfect person. That's the beauty. I'm probably one of those guys that you know. Uh, did you ever see the movie Defending Your Life? No. With Albert Brooks, they show him his past lives, and there's this one where he's running from this lion, and he said, "What were you?" He goes, "Breakfast." <laughs> <laughs> like. <laughs> What were you in your past life? Breakfast, you know? Well, so I, I also ask this too, and I ask it kind of seriously because I feel like when I ask people about their artistic likes, so people who are not, um, uh, who have not chosen a vocation in the arts or, or not in the process of choosing vocation in the arts, when they respond to me about what they like, like music or writing or sculpting or painting or something, um, there is a different kind of energy that comes out with that answer. There, there is something that's uh, uh, that it seems they're very attached to, and this is this is my question: When somebody who is in touch with their artistry, with their creative self, and decides to pursue that, like you did and like you do, do you think it's something that you remember better than others, or more clearly than others? What do I remember the or let's let's use the word remember or no. I'm not sure I understand the nature of your question. Well, so you use the word bravery before, you know, it's a kind of a brave thing. Um, I'm not going to say that you are more brave than I am, but I am going to say that you are more in touch with the core of you or were let's say, were when you were younger than I was? Well, the thing that I connected with was that people would say, you're crazy to try that. And I would say, well, maybe you'd be crazy to try that. 
but I'm not crazy to try that. And, and the, the thing that astounded me when I first, when I started out, I mean, I first told a group of my friends in high school that I wanted to be an actor, 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 I could barely say it now. Mm-hmm. I want to be an actor, boom, spit it out. They all fell down on the grass and started laughing. I mean, laughing hysterically, like this is really what you're going to do. And I remember that moment. It was humiliating. <laughs> well, that's their conditioning. That's not because I was about kids. 15 or 16 years old. And I told a bunch of buddies, you know, this is what I'm thinking I want to do. Sure. And like, I mean, it was like, oh, what would you want to do? What would you do? I, you know, I want to rule the world. Oh, I want to be an actor. <laughs> but um, what astounded me is that, especially at that age, is that people's just lack of like, uh, there was a fear aspect to a lot of people's mm-hmm. lives. Oh, I couldn't try that. Well, as far as I was concerned, I mean, my father's proposition kind of worked. Like, well, if it doesn't work in a year or two, then I'll do something else. You know, and when I auditioned for the National, for the Vancouver Playhouse, excuse me, burp. Okay, when I, we'll, we'll edit that out. Edit that out. Unless, unless we're improv now. Well, no, actually, I think that was a natural progression after when I auditioned <laughs> for the Vancouver Playhouse. Ah, ah. In the National Theater School, which I could give a bigger belch on, Yes. They, they asked me at the end of my audition when I realized, boy, I really didn't do a good audition. One of the questions they ask is like, if you don't make it as an actor or uh, would you do something else in the theater or in the arts? It's like, oh, God, God. Wow. that's the fallback question. Like, you know, well, like, they, they also they also said something else to you. You, you want to share that story too? the CBC? Well, yeah. when I auditioned for the CBC in 1978 in Vancouver for a woman whose name should be nameless, but she had a crisp British accent uh, that I'm not going to recreate now. She looked at me and she looked at my picture and she looked at what I had to offer. And she said, well, you really don't look Canadian now, do you? And I was flummoxed by that statement. I thought it and still do believe it is uh, <laughs> remarkably uh, inappropriate, um, racist, yeah. stupid. That's, that's being nice. So I called my dad that night and said, you know, I, you know what this woman at the CBC said to me today? <laughs> and I told him, and I didn't look Canadian. He went, what? I fought in the Second World War in the... GD Royal Canadian Air Force. I spent four years in England, five, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know? And like, I moved to the United States and I worked at Second City and I went on stage and I worked eight years at Second City. I did oh, thousands of shows, thousands of shows, hundreds of performances on the road. I mean, we, my brother and I did the math. I mean, it's a remarkable number of shows I did it in eight years. I mean, there's one year when I didn't take one night off. I mean, wow. <laughs> straight. I mean, I think I worked like 48 nights in a row. Did you feel the 48 nights? Hmm? Did you feel the 48 nights? Or did it fly oh, by? Yeah, I, I feel it all the time, bro. <laughs> I, every night. I mean, one thing about working on the stage is you can't. Well, I, I never phoned it in. You can't. Yeah. But but um, it's like I phone my parents up and say, I'm a member of a comedy cult. But, you know, I, I'm doing what you told me, Dad. I got a job in the theater. But um, what was I going to say about working all that time on the stage? Like, first of all, you, you learn how to act on the head of a pen. And then the other thing is that you, you um, develop a respect for it. I mean, and, and um, uh, where was I going with this before that? Um, well, you said you started with the, you, you and your brother did the math on how many shows you did. Yeah, um, no, it's, it's just a bit of what I was going to say about the Second City experience was that um, – Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I did all these shows at Second City, and nobody had the audacity, temerity to ever say I didn't look American. <laughs> and I've auditioned for a lot of things, and nobody's ever said I don't look American. So the only time I experienced that was, you know, way back when, when I believe Canada was held more culturally hostage by a British sort of artistic establishment, which I think is probably waned a little bit now. Well said. Held hostage. Well said. Um uh, you, you did say something about uh, what you learned uh, doing all that theater work was a difference between uh, a TV actor and a theater actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the patience. Well, you know, sometimes you meet, uh, you work with in the film business and the TV business actors that have never done theater. And it becomes more and more common, particularly on the West Coast, 
of the United States. I mm-hmm. can't really speak much for Canada. I mean, although I think there are more actors now that solely dedicate themselves to script, film and TV. It'd be an interesting thing to find out. But the ones that have spent a lot of time in the theater, I think have an infinite degree of more patience and understanding uh, for the process, period. It's just the truth. I've worked with film actors that, that are so um, um, not so sort of not knowledgeable about sort of technical aspects of acting, but also sort of a overall vibe of the zeitgeist of the work. And there's an impatience that doesn't suit the work that, you know, a person who's been in the theater sort of has a lot more measured uh, understanding of, period. End of statement. Um, question. That, that's my experience. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it's fair. I wanted you to share that. Um, where do you exist after you die? What do you believe? Well, you know, that's... Um, um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that... Um, I think we go back into that room we were in before, you know, and I, I wish that there was a grandiose place where we could see all our family. I mean, I, God, I'd love to see my parents again and several friends and family members and a few family members I would not want to see. But anyway, um, I think that we go to a place of sort of neutrality. That would be my I can't think of, I can't think of, um, I can't think that heaven is a, is a, is a, is a, I think it's a human fantasy. Hmm. Do do you think in this place of neutrality that you would still be, um, you still be creating? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Hmm. I don't think so. I think I would just be, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a out of. That's an incredibly uh, deep and interesting question. Um, I've had sort of a on again, off again relationship with God, and I don't know whether they exist. It exists, but I have an overall sense that there is. There's got to be something. So yeah. I just, I, I don't know, Luciano, but the, the religion, um, I've been, you know, my father used to say, uh, uh, you know, ignore the people, just love the, uh, love the, uh, the dogma, the, the, the theocracy. But, you know, growing up in the Greek Orthodox Church, you are... Uh, you were exposed to a garden variety of different types of people and in terms of the messengers, the priests. <laughs> and uh, my parents were quite religious, and I just don't know whether I, it worked for me. It works for me. Well, I, I, uh, You're going to have to cut all this out. This is really boring. Why? No, I don't think it's boring at all. And in fact, I, I don't ask in religious terms either, uh, with any kind of uh, religious uh, prejudice. Or- yeah, no, it, but I, I um, I have to say, I, I, I'm, I'm, and this is not an attractive thing to say, but I really do not have a handle on the whole aspect of dying, and I'm not really um, sanguine uh, in the pocket with the notion of dying and i am afraid of it huh. and it's something that i've been consciously afraid of since i was 11 or 12 when i went camping with my family up uh, my brother and, and saw a shooting star and he said you know every time you see a shooting star it means a soul is going to heaven and then i had a panic attack I realized oh this is not going to last all the time and that people go to heaven and they die and I remember that moment vividly. And since that moment, it's sort of like, you know, life has not been as much fun. (laughs) 
But the realization of that, particularly of late, you know, I lost a really dear friend this year and, you know, my, both my parents have gone a long time ago and, you know, death stalks us all. I would really hope that we go into a room with a lot of instruments and um, with a lot of really fantastically interesting and beautiful people in various states of dress and undress. <laughs> and um, that, that would be described as a traditional hell, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Where people I, are having too much fun. I and, don't know. Well, I mean, or maybe just a quiet room like a library with great books. This, uh, allow me to ask you one uh, about one little last story because I don't know in my head I, I think there's a bridge I'm there's a connection I'm making I don't know depending on how this comes out because I, I want to return back to this so thank you Did for you edit this all down or no oh I'm not editing a thing not even okay. your burp not even your burp um, well, um you deserve another burp <laughs> you're uh you had another story about your dad when he came over and he was 11. So the story that you shared with me and then his friend Mitchell, Nick, was it Nick, Nick Mitchell? Yeah. Well, you know, dad when he came over on the boat. Um, I didn't know much about it as a child. Right. And then he, um, I moved to Chicago in 1978 and Chicago, for those who don't know, in the in the greek world is like uh you know one of the big villages if you don't know anybody in chicago then you're not greek <laughs> and every greek has a relative or a friend i happen to have two great uncles my my grandfather's brothers lived in chicago many many years ago so they're, they're you know my dad knew the city a little bit but he never really went there uh, much uh, growing up so but when I moved there, he said, I'm going to come and visit you. So he did. And then when he got there, he said, you know, I have a friend of mine that uh, is a friend of yours. I said, yeah, well, actually, he's not a friend of mine. We both came over in the boat together. And we were uh, 11 years old. And I met him at Pipireas, and his name is Nick Mitchell. And we huddled together, holding one another on the boat, and cried all the way from Marseille to Halifax. And then from Halifax to Montreal, we were in better spirits. So wait a minute, you held each other and cried? He goes, yeah, we were little, little boys. We were both, you know, we were both alone. We became friends. And, I, you know, we got off of Montreal, and he got picked up by his family, and I got picked up by my brother, and I haven't seen him since. Said, you haven't seen him since? Okay, this is 1923 when, Dad, this happened. And now this is 1978. You do the math. 55 years. Yeah. <laughs> so um we're in chicago and he looks up nick mitchell well these two men saw one another and then ran towards each other and embraced each other and must have cried for about an hour and a half wow they must have just bawled like children for an hour and a half holding one another you know two men probably in their 60s um and they explained what happened it was quite emotional and ironically the restaurant mitchell's was three blocks from where i lived in chicago so after dad left and went back i would go and nick mitchell would fix me breakfast and his brother and, and unfortunately both the mitchell brothers are gone and their kids now live in arizona i keep in touch with them but man i was treated like a king king if i wanted food at two in the morning or two in the afternoon i took friends into mitchell's they just knew who i was at the corner of clark and north avenue in chicago right by the chicago historical society and oh the, them were the days and 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 mr mitchell nick mitchell um had tragedy in his life i mean you know he had a son who was in a motorcycle accident was paralyzed from the neck down he uh, he had another son uh, that uh, had issues, you know, and, and so, you know, life was not easy for them. Um, but when he and my dad saw one another, that was uh, remarkable. And, you know, I am, um, you know, I, I saw my father in you, you know, all of a sudden I saw my dad near, you know, in his early 60s. 
like he was 11 years old and and uh, but also saw an emotional side of him that I had rarely seen maybe maybe I'm making too much of this um but maybe that crying after 60 years of not seeing each other is a remembering um like it's an expression for remembering um a past belief like your sense of creativity is like a remembering of part of who you are. And maybe that's why you do it. Maybe you wanted to be closer to that core. I mean, it, just my idea, maybe a philosophy, I don't know, but well, you know, just I an think, idea. I think creative people, in a sense, are hoarders. Um, they hoard emotions, they hoard things, and they hoard things that they don't want to give up and they don't want to, they don't want to part with. And sometimes the funny thing is, is that I will write something or think of something and I'll not want to give it up for a long time before I do a song, an idea, a long time might be, whatever. I mean, there's sometimes you just want to keep it to yourself. And I've talked to various people, writers of music and famous creators of screenplays and stuff. And they, you know, they say that an idea is a personal, very personal part of your almost personal uh, antique uh, closet. But once it's out in the world, you know, everybody else has their hands on it and then they can use it, the ideas for what they are. I mean, they, they can. And um, I think creative people in a strange way, you know, um, even the most audacious and, and wild of them are, are very, very shy and very, very private. And the, the uh, motivation to get out these ideas comes from a very deep and, I believe, um, secular, I mean, private space within your soul. Sort of a place where you really need to express it. And, you know, I am. I, um, I look at my time, time right now, and, and I hope that I have a lot of time left to, to do what I want to do. Um, but I realize that people such as yourself and others might look at you know, a person like me and go, well, you know, I guess you're wrapping it up now. huh?" I, I know you're not saying that, but, but you know, pe people tend to say, well, you know, you've reached a certain age, and I guess, you know, you should know these things. You should know certain things. And, and and let me tell you something as to somebody who's older than you. The, the, with age, does not necessarily wisdom come. There are a lot of people mm -hmm. <laughs> that that just don't get wiser as they get older. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, don't attribute don't attribute things to older people just because they're older. You know, make sure that they've done the work because a lot of people just don't do the work. They don't do the. They, they're not. Self-critical. I mean, I'm not even talking about creative types. I'm just talking about people that general. Yeah, you know, they just don't. Uh, that's a good lesson in life. Uh, be around people who do the work. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, um, my uh, therapist many years ago said that you know one of the things you is that you have to talk to people that you love and care for on a on a certain level. Um, on, 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 on an equal level, you're not greater than or less than, you're equal to. And in Hollywood, you know, there, there's this expression, they're either at your knees or at your throat. Um, you know, like, oh, God, you're the worst thing in the world, you know, that you're there at your throat. Or your knees, please do this. You know, it's either or. It's very little. Pleading or threatening. <laughs> pleading or threatening. Desperate or, you know, angry. Mm -hmm. um, two horrible extremes. But, but in life, you know, you know, the, the people I valued when I was a boy, when I was a kid, were the, the adults that talked to me, you know, not, hey, John, what are you doing? Or, you know, oh, you know, talking down to me, but, you know, talking to me as a, as a person. And um, <clears throat> that's one of the things I learned very early on at the theater is when I was at Second City, I was not liked when I first went to Chicago intensely for a little while because I was a jerk. And then one day I was backstage with a dear, very dear friend of mine, my buddy, Mike Haggerty, who just passed away. And I, I mentioned this at his eulogy because I spoke and I said, 
because Mike was a very um, um, spirited, had a great spirit. And, and I said to him, you know, Mike, you know, people aren't treating me this way. People aren't treating me that way. So he looked at me, he says, do you treat them that way? And then all of a sudden I realized, he said, you have to treat people the way you want to be treated, which is the Christian golden rule. But, you know, when you really learn that on a very basic level, I mean, things turned around for me instantly at Second City creatively. I started treating people the way I wanted to be treated. And overall, I think that served me well. Um, and I know that that's almost simplistic, and it's certainly uh, uh, um, difficult to live by, though. You had a friend who did the work. Yeah, and you know what? I had a friend that was 23 or 4 years old. He was about a year or two older than me at the time. I was 21 or 2. I was 22 and I started Second City. So he's a couple years older than me. But the thing is that he was wise, you know? Mm. I know people that are my age or I, I've known people that are in their 80s or 90s. They do not necessarily have wisdom. So, it, you know, he had something there that, um, you know, and I remember somebody saying to me, um, every voice is the voice of God. You know, and sometimes you hear things in the street and they catch your ear and you go, was I meant to hear that? Now, I again, like the voice of God, but, you know, it's like these things happen, you know, you, that may sound like I'm a holy roller believer, but, you know, sometimes you look upon these things as being important. I have a friend of mine who um, listens to these voices much more often um, and they used to follow him around. And after a while, he stopped asking who it was. He just listens to the advice and is open to the experience in listening to the advice. Mm. Uh, sorry, it, it, I, I felt I needed to share that. I don't know, because you, you just mentioned it. Yeah, Last that's... question, yeah. John, and then I'll let you go. What, what is greatness to you? Humility. Um, understanding, empathy. Sensitivity, uh, qualities that I think are in desperate need of replenishment these days amongst a lot of types of people. I, you know, um, I think that one has to approach every day with a certain degree of, you know, happiness uh i think that one of the greater gifts that a person give can give another person is to be present and also to not complain you know um you know uh, everybody's got money problems everybody's got aches and pains and everybody's got anger and humiliation and sometimes the ability to, for people to overshare in those areas really does not i think i think sometimes it, it's 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 almost better to to understand that other people have those things going on with them too and um in that's what i mean by empathy um you know, I, I had a friend, he's no longer around, that used to complain about money all the time until, like, he basically died without any money. But mm. um, but he would never, ever ask me about how my financial situation was, you know. And I just found, like, after a while, whenever he complained about money, I I sort of would turn off because I, I there was no kind of... But yeah, the, the people that, you know, say, hey, you know, I'm having a bad time. How about you? How do you handle it? I mean, what's going on? You know, the, the sort of empathetic circle. I don't know. I mean, you're asking me a, a complicated question and I'm giving you a pedantic answer. I think, well, I think, I think in a lot of ways, um, what I, I, I feel people don't do really is, um, approach others with a truly an open mind we're so politically closed down these days that when i meet somebody who 
may not share what I share value-wise, that the conversation is closed down, particularly in, in the U.S. of A, right away because they see that you don't agree with them. But what bothers me is that there's no sense of ever being able to convince anybody otherwise because their minds are made up. And I try to not be in a position where my mind is so, sort of made up all the time. And the only way I can really give you a great example of this is creatively, is that when I was in my early 20s, I'd look at a film script and I'd say, this film script is really bad and this one's really great. But now I'll read the same two film scripts and I'll say, well, the one that I thought was bad is actually can be made really well. And why I thought it was bad was not necessarily reasons why it's going to, and, and the one I thought was really great was made really badly. So when you realize, as you get older, you realize that sometimes your opinions about stuff are not that important. And, or, and, or it can be fluid and change. Or, or they can be wrong. <laughs> or wrong. <laughs> yeah, you can be dead, dead wrong about stuff when you're absolutely convinced you were right. So um, I, I think that that goes circles right back to the notion of humility. Because if, if you're truly a humble person and you've got humility, then you'll go, you know what? I was wrong. That was wrong. I am sorry. I made a mistake. That was wrong. I was, Ill, you know, boy, oh, boy. You know, can you imagine? Could you imagine if certain politicians in the United States and Canada um, I don't give a shit what stripe they're from, could just say that with real belief. Like, oh, you know what? The problem is, you know, there's going to be somebody that's going to hang them on the thing for saying that they were wrong. But you know what? I would rather say somebody say I was wrong about something than, than you know, insist like, you know, I won the election. Most of us would. At our core, most when, of us when, would. When it's alive, you know, et cetera. John, uh, I expected it to be a pleasure, and I wasn't disappointed. Uh, well, I hope that I didn't uh, bore you too much. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. Um, I, I only have really two words left for you. What? Efaristo Poli. Oh, Efaristo. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. You're awesome. Thank you, John. All right. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director, and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today? There's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired. <laughs>